Okay, we're gonna get going now. Uh, thank you all for joining another SDEC session. My name is Adam Greco from Search Discovery and I will be moderating behind the scenes and at the end of our session. For those of you who are new to the SDEC, uh, this is a free educational community in the area of digital marketing and digital analytics. And we try to host weekly webinars to educate the community and anyone out there who wants to kind of up their skill level. We have about 12 topics. And if you join the SDEC, which is free, uh, you will be automatically notified of sessions that relate to topics that you tell us you're interested in. Uh, in the, the uh, chat area, I'll be putting information to join the SDEC if you are not already a member. Also, if you are a member, I'm going to be putting information on how to join the SDEC Slack group. The Slack group is where we put all of the recordings of all of the past webinars, and we have about 50 or so already that you can go uh, check out at your leisure on demand. If you have any questions or technical issues related to Zoom or the SDEC, I'll be monitoring the chat and you can ping uh, the panelists area and just ask us questions about the SDC or how to join or how to get in the Slack group and so on. But if you have questions for our presenter, please use the Zoom Q&A instead of the chat and we'll go through all of those questions at the end. This session is being recorded if you want to check it out later or if you want to share it with any coworkers. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Fow. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Adam. Good to be here with you all. Um, happy to share some ideas and research with the rest of the community. So today I'm going to actually try something a little bit different. It's going to be interactive. So as I'm going through some of the background material, um, if, you, if you all uh, have a chance, uh, pull out a piece of paper and a pen. Uh, because we're going to have an interactive session about one third of the way through. So I'm going to ask you questions and it's going to be kind of the honor system. So you can uh, write down your answer. I'll be giving you choices A and B and then write it down or lock it in in your mind. And then I'll reveal the answer. And then maybe by the end of this, you can kind of do your own self-assessment to see how many of the answers you got right. So I'm doing this uh, under the assumption that uh, this is a more advanced analytics community. Um, I've had very good experience with search discovery as have my clients. So we're gonna kind of treat this as a roll up your sleeves uh, interactive session. So uh, just a, a little bit about my background. I've been doing digital marketing for 25 years, all of that here in New York City. Uh, recently, I've delved into this area of ad fraud and I've been investigating it because with the rise of programmatic, we've also seen a dramatic rise in ad fraud. So a lot of the bot activity is basically being recorded uh, in analytics. And unless you know how to clean up that bot activity, you're gonna be optimizing for incorrect analytics. So for example, if the bots are generating a lot of clicks and those clicks make the CTRs look really attractive, uh, you might end up accidentally sending more money to the bad guys. And we definitely don't want that to happen. So that's why we're studying uh, fraud. And we're going to look at how we can detect fraud using Google Analytics and then also look a little bit beyond Google Analytics. So just as a quick refresher, uh, obviously, everyone knows uh, about ad fraud and basically what it is. It's uh, ad impressions shown to bots and not to humans. And this involves both search ads as well as display ads. But in the most simplistic form, it's basically when a, a web page loads, um, the ads load. Unfortunately, the page was caused to load by a bot and not a human visiting. And the reason we see a dramatic increase in fraud in recent years is because we've kind of removed the physical constraints of the physical world. So on the left hand side, you see this kind of comical picture of a lot of billboards by the side of the road but there's only so many you can stick by the side of the highway. Whereas on the right-hand side, when we move into digital, we no longer have these physical constraints. So you see an example of a web page that has no content whatsoever, but many, many ad units. So these are examples of fake sites that are designed solely to uh, run as many ad impressions as possible. So in recent years, the amount of fraud has gone up because with programmatic technologies, we now have the ability to place ads on 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of different sites, most of which you haven't checked out yourself, right? So uh, on the one hand, it's a good thing that we can automate the buying and selling of the ads. But on the other hand, it's allowed the criminals to scale their fraud operations as well. So if you look at this trend chart here and you see the yellow and green lines, you'll see that both of those have kind of plateaued since roughly 2010, 2011. So those two lines, the yellow and green, represent humans usage of the Internet, social and mobile. So while those are roughly horizontal, you'll see that the blue line continues to shoot upward. That is the digital ad spend. So we've reached about $150 billion in 2020. This is digital ad spending in the US and the worldwide numbers are about 350 billion being spent in digital. So you see that red area uh, that's opening up between the blue line and the yellow and green lines. That's the area that really can't be accounted for by more humans using the internet using social media and using mobile more, right? So it's gotta be something else. And then what we're gonna do in the rest of this uh, webinar is to really look for telltale signs of fraudulent activity. And then for all intents and purposes, the kind of fraud that I look for uh, are concentrated in the first two buckets of digital ad spend, impressions and clicks. And that's because 92% of digital ad spend is concentrated uh, in these first two buckets. Of course, there's fraud in uh, lead generation and affiliate sales, but because those numbers are much smaller, uh, the bad guys are concentrating their activity uh, in these first two buckets. And these days um, they're using the, their large botnets to do so. So if you look at this chart plotting the named botnets or what I call famous botnets over time, you'll see that on the left hand side of the chart, there are red ones and, and black ones. And these are botnets used for DDoS or distributed denial of service uh, and also spam and ransomware and things like that. But as you move over to the right hand side of the chart, so bringing us up to modern times, if you will, uh, you'll see that more and more of these botnets are colored green, uh, the color of money. And that's because these botnets primary use is now digital ad fraud, because in the past, when you have a botnet that can generate so much traffic to overwhelm a site uh, and take it down, uh, that's not lucrative. You can't make money from that uh, other than ransom or extortion. But now if you point that same traffic fire hose from these botnets to sites that have ad tech on them, you can now generate an enormous amount of traffic and generate an enormous amount of ad revenue. So that's why these botnets are now primarily used for uh, ad fraud purposes, and that's why they're colored green. But even while all this is happening, the trade associations have typically downplayed ad fraud and said their programs are keeping it under control, or you'll see in the middle tag says IBT is 1.4%. But as we'll look at some of the analytics together, you'll realize that there's still a lot of fraud that's not caught by IBT detection. IBT stands for invalid traffic detection. So basically as analytics professionals, it's our job and it's our opportunity to help find the fraud, even if the marketers may not like to hear about it. All right, so let's get into a little bit more of the evidence. So this is a cartoon I drew not me personally, but I had drawn in uh, 2017. And I think it still applies. I just had to change the year on here. So a lot of the marketers would prefer not to hear about ad fraud. Uh, the ad tech providers, the ad exchanges would prefer not to talk about ad fraud. And the verification technologies are pretty much finding the ants while the bot is standing right behind them and taking money out of the vault. So again, uh, part of what we can do is look at the analytics for telltale signs of fraud and start to mitigate and reduce those in our own campaigns. All right, so I'm gonna run through some of these. I'll share the deck afterwards. So all of these links you'll see, but just to give you a few examples um, from over the years. So in 2020, as more and more ad dollars poured into CTV or connected TV uh, spending or ads, uh, the fraud cases also start to, started to pile up. So all of these are named and we already had our first one back in January. Of, of this year called Paraterra. So all of these are 
very large fraud schemes, stealing money from CTV campaigns. And there's also a rampant amount of fraud in mobile apps. So not only are there fake mobile apps designed solely to load ad impressions, you combine that with fake devices. So these are mobile emulators that pretend to be mobile devices that can load dozens of apps and run them or play them continuously to generate ad impressions. So the scale of ad fraud in mobile is still very, very large. And then finally, you've probably come across these things, uh, the malvertising attacks, where you might be visiting a mainstream site like New York Times or Wall Street Journal, but then you get a pop-up that says you've won a gift card from T-Mobile or Walmart, click here. So these are malware redirects or malvertising redirects that take people to a site like a malicious site where they ultimately get compromised. And the reason the hackers do that is so that when they get malware on your device, they can actually start to commit ad fraud. So for example, if there's malicious code or a malicious app installed on your device and you don't know it's there, it can continuously load ads in the background so that they can make money through ad fraud, right? So the moral of the story is that uh, overall fraud is much more than just bots or IVT. So if you're using a bot detection vendor or an IVT detection vendor, they're probably gonna catch the 1%, right? That's the bot fraud. But there's other forms of fraud that are not technically bots hitting a web page, And those are typically missed or not measured by these fraud detection technologies. So as an example, the alarm clock app is loading lots and lots of ads in the background that's not gonna be picked up by standard IVT detection technologies. Or there are various things that a website can do to cheat. For example, ad stacking, stacking a whole bunch of ads on top of each other. Uh, Pixel stuffing, where they're stuffing all the ads in one by one uh, size windows or zero by zero size windows so you can't see it. Or pop unders or pop overs. So all of these forms of fraud are not typically accounted for by bot detection technologies. So in some cases like this one, there could be nearly 60 times more fraud that's not caught by standard bot detection technologies. And that's why we see um, you know, this rise in ad spending because the number of ads available to be purchased continues to go up, even though the yellow and green lines are relatively uh, plateaued. So this next section, we're gonna actually get into uh, finding fraud with Google Analytics. Um, this is right before the interactive session, but let me ask the, the group whether you all are using hourly reports uh, in Google Analytics. If not, that's fine. I'm gonna show you how I do it. So a lot of the uh, people who use Google Analytics, they're seeing what I'm gonna call rolled up data. So basically, uh, you know, you, there's only three uh, selections, day, week, and month. So when you get a daily chart like this, uh, basically, what can you tell? Uh, to me, I really can't tell too much other than how much traffic I got or how many users in this case, right? So rolled up data is very limited in terms of the insights that you can get from it. The second example would be averaged data, right? So in this case, you see a typical screenshot from Google Analytics. You'll see the number of users, then you'll see the sessions, the bounce rate, the pages per session, things like that. So those are all rolled up to each line item. But again, uh, what can you do with this data? To me, not that much. So have a, have a look at this next chart. What can you actually tell from this? So I know you can't respond uh, other than through chat, but just have a closer look. Look at the pages per session, look at the average session duration, and then look at the bounce rate. And then finally, on the right-hand side, look at the operating system for each of these four different referral sources. So I'll let you sit with that for just a minute. And then finally, uh, when we are able to select the hourly option, we're able to see the patterns um, in the line, the colored lines. And what you'll notice is that for each of the three days, November 11th, November 12th, and November 13th, each of the lines has roughly the same shape. And you can see the volume actually go down to uh, much smaller right before the, the day ticks over to the next day. So you'll see that these four lines representing four different referrers 
have basically the, <clears throat> the same shape, which is abnormal. So let me show you how I go about uh, selecting the hourly charts. So typically hourly charts are not available in the acquisition tab. Uh, that choice is simply not available. So what you have to do is actually go manually uh, create segments. So I'm sure some of you already know how to do this and then I'll share the deck later. So for some of you who are new to the analytics, uh, you can actually have these step-by-step -step ways of creating segments. But basically what, we, what I do is I create a segment for each of those referring sources, okay? So you can see I've created the four segments and then you actually go into the audience overview and then you apply those segments. And that's how we get a view like this. So once you have the hourly view, you can actually see these abnormal patterns where all of the traffic from each of these four different sources all drop off at the same time. So the reason this is suspicious is because it's very difficult to get human audiences to coordinate their behavior across multiple different completely unrelated uh, referring sites. But yet in this case, if you now look at the pages per session, they're all right around five pages per session. So again, four different referring sites have pretty much uh, given you visitors that all behave the same. And then similarly, the average session duration is hovering around six to seven minutes. And then finally, the bounce rates are all super low, around one to 2% with a high of 3%. And then the, the, one, the last thing on the right-hand side, you'll see that all of these visitors, 98 to 99% of them are Android. So do any of you think that this is a normal set of users visiting your website? Hopefully you understand that this is not normal and you would look into something like this. So um, human audiences really cannot coordinate their behavior like this, but it's extremely simple for botnets to change their behavior in the same way or behave in exactly the same way. So what I use this uh, to illustrate is the behavior of botnets. So each of these four sites are buying traffic from the same botnet and the botnet is tuned to behave in the same way. So generate five page views per session and then leave. Stay on the site an average of five to six minutes and then leave. And then in doing so, they're able to tune the bounce rates down to very low. So if you're an analytics professional that's not on the lookout for bot activity, you'll say, wow, my bounce rates are so low, it's awesome, right? But it's actually because of bot activity, not because humans really want it to stay on your site. And then furthermore, if you see all these uh, visitors are coming from Android. So this is another telltale sign to say it's something strange here. But again, if you're on the lookout for botnets, this is a botnet that's made from Android devices. All right. So yeah, so a couple of questions in the in the Q and A. Um, yeah, you you should really check the referring traffic referral traffic coming into your site, but um, pull out the ones that have dramatic changes. Like all of a sudden, there's a dramatic amount of traffic coming from a particular source. Those are the ones you should check out. You probably don't need to do this for every single source, but uh, you, you should check out the ones that are coming out of nowhere and generating a tremendous amount of volume on your site, right? Really pick out the top five to 10 most egregious bad guys first, okay? Um, and then let's see, let's take a look at this next slide. So I'm starting to get into the interactive session and this would just be a um, section. It's gonna be just the um, honor system. So I'm gonna ask you a question and then you decide on an answer. You can choose to write it down on your piece of paper if you'd like to, or just you know remember that answer in your mind. So the first question on this slide is, would you buy more media from this website? Yes or no? And what we're looking for, again, this is a screenshot from Google Analytics, is the sessions. So you can notice there's about 102,000 sessions in the left-hand side, and it all drops down to zero sessions. And then right below that, you'll see a plot of the goal events. So I'll give you a second to think about this. Would you buy more media from this site, yes or no? Okay, lock in your answer. And basically, hopefully a lot of you chose no, 
And the explanation for this is that when the sessions drop to zero, there's no change in the goal events. That tells you that those sessions uh, are probably not driving any goal events or conversions on your site anyway. So if you just looked at those two, common sense will tell you, okay, this is probably not a very valuable site to keep buying ad impressions on. And then on top of that, we have a color chart. I'll show you that later. It's from my platform called Foo Analytics. We can actually see the reason for that, right? So now we can actually see, oh, well, it's because all those sessions come from dark red. So those are bots, uh, dark blue means humans. So when all of the bots went away, uh, obviously it didn't affect the goal events because those bots coming to your site, they're not gonna convert, they're not gonna buy something from you anyway, right? So uh, the answer to this is no, I don't wanna buy from that site anymore. Here's another example from a small business owner. Uh, she was looking at her Google Analytics when she turned on a programmatic campaign. And if you take a look at the two highlighted uh, sections, so Android device, you'll see that uh, the sessions grew by 190,000% when she turned on that campaign. So this is what I mean by looking for uh, unexplainable changes, right? Things that are going uh, you know, either dramatically up or dramatically down. So in this case, the number of Android devices coming to her site went up by 190,000%. So these are the things you should look into. And if you remember the previous slide, it was all these Android devices that were part of a botnet that came to the site. All right, so in this case, you would wanna figure out the origin of it and then actually turn those domains off so that you no longer buy ads from them. Okay, here's another example from a small business owner who was running his own uh, Facebook campaigns. So it might be a little bit hard to read, but let me just point out two things here. On the upper left-hand side, the Facebook dashboard shows that there's about 4,000 clicks on these different ads across different campaigns. But when he looked at his own Google Analytics, he can only record 1,500 or about a third of the number of clicks that Facebook reported. So these are all looking at the referrals that are coming from Facebook. So in this case, when you see a large discrepancy like this, where two thirds of the clicks cannot be accounted for, right? There's a two thirds discrepancy uh, between what Facebook was reporting versus what your own Google Analytics is reporting. Uh, that's a time to look into it, right? I mean, some of this is purely common sense and I'm sure you guys are you know, looking at this in your, in your analytics uh, anyway. So uh, when you see these kind of discrepancies, definitely dig in. Um, there's a question in, in the panel saying, what's the relation to Android? Uh, there just happens to be a lot of fraud pertaining to Android devices because there's a ton more uh, Google uh, uh, Android apps in Google Play. There's, there's still fraud with iOS apps, but because the, Apple is much, much more strict about who they let into the Apple App Store, uh, there's far fewer of these apps that are outright committing fraud. Right, so that's why the Apple ecosystem has less fraud than the Android ecosystem. Okay, so for this next one, um, again, lock in your answer. Uh, in this case, when you look at just the pattern of cumulative views, these are video statistics taken from YouTube. Um, which, uh, which chart, A or B, do you think is showing real cumulative views as opposed to ones that are faked by buying uh, YouTube views from uh, someone selling YouTube views. So you choose A or B, which one is real? I'll give you a second to lock in your answer in your own mind. Okay, if you have your answer locked in, let me reveal. So hopefully you chose B. Uh, and so when you compare the two lines, uh, the first one is a straight line. These are cumulative views. That means day over day, you've added the same exact amount of views. That's how you get a straight line. Versus the one on the bottom, you'll see an accumulation and then a topping off, right? And then if you look closely, there's two little bumps in there uh, where there's additional volume generated by TV ads. So this was an example from years ago where the Old Spice, uh, Old Spice ran a TV ad. And when they ran the TV ad, then people came online to search for that same ad because they wanted to watch it over. So in that curve, you'll see two additional 
uh, bumps in the in the cumulative uh, curve, and then you see it's supported by the spike in volume on those two occasions. Whereas the one on the top, it's pretty much horizontal. Uh, sorry, pretty much straight a straight line, which means the same quantity of views was added uh, for each time period. So that's a telltale sign of purchased views because the way you go out and buy views for your YouTube video is I want to buy 100,000 views per day. And then those add up. So you're adding the same amount every day and that's what generates a straight line in the cumulative views. So then you can also take a look at this one. You can now hopefully tell which YouTube videos are supported by fake views versus ones that are real. Okay, so in this case, it's perfectly straight line. Okay, so um, I'll leave you with just a couple of uh, quick uh, tips uh, that I typically look for, right? So I look for straight lines and abrupt changes. Um, when you look at analytics and you see straight lines, something is wrong. Um, things don't happen in a perfectly repeatable way that, that way, right? So uh, first of all, look for any kind of straight lines in your analytics. If you see any of those, investigate further. The second one is look for anything that is too high or too low. So for example, if you see uh, referral sources that have 100% bounce rates, okay, check into it. Uh, something's wrong with that. Also, if you see referral sources that have 0% bounce rates, uh, something's wrong with that. That shouldn't happen. Uh, so check into those as well. So again, you don't have to boil the ocean. Uh, look for the things that are clearly strange and those are the ones you kind of dig into. And then finally, the third tip comes from, you know, uh, my study of botnets. So a person who, uh, like a bot master who's maintaining a botnet can easily issue a command to tell the bots to all click on the same place or all stay on the same page for X period of time or whatever. Uh, or they can actually say, okay, uh, stay on the page for random amounts of time. So it's really easy to uh, program or tell a botnet to behave in either a perfectly ordered way or perfectly random way. Those are one line of instructions. So in this case, when you see behavior that is too consistent or too random, uh, either of those two extremes, uh, those are abnormal because human audiences don't move that way. So normally if you're dealing with a human audience, there should be something like a bell-shaped curve, right? So there's a certain number of things that most humans do similar to others, but they can't behave in exactly the same way. Right. So anything that's too ordered or too random, you should definitely look into. OK, so, Adam, we're right at time. But this next section is we're going to kind of move out of Google Analytics. Uh, is it OK if we do a few of these pairs and then I can pause it after about five, ten minutes? And then uh, yeah. yeah, you've been answering some of the questions along the way. So, yeah, um, let's try to go five more minutes and okay. crank through. Perfect. All right, so some of the charts that you're gonna see in the next few slides are taken from the analytics platform that I built. It's really a tool set that I use to help audit uh, uh, digital campaigns for clients. And there's two aspects of it. One is site analytics, where uh, the code goes on the site, very similar to Google Analytics. And then the second is what I call media analytics. And this is where the tags go into the ad impressions. And these ads go out through programmatic channels onto hundreds of thousands of sites. And just as background, uh, red means bots, blue means humans. Okay, so hopefully with that background, uh, let me present you with a few of these charts and ask you to choose A or B. So just looking at this first pair, uh, which site would you buy your ads on or place your ads on, A or B? So this should be a quick one, lock in your answers, A or B. Okay, it should be pretty obvious, it's A because blue means humans, red means bots. So now with color coding, you can easily tell uh, you don't wanna be placing your ads on a site that has that much dark red, right? Whereas you want to be placing your ads on a site that has a lot of dark blue. Okay. The next one um, is also the blue and red. Uh, which chart shows real human traffic surges, A or B? So just so you know, the green bars represent the volume per hour. So when you see a, a dramatic rise in the green bars, you'll see um, that's, that means a traffic search. Okay, so which one shows real 
human traffic surges, A or B? Lock in your answer. Okay, hopefully you all chose B. And so that is actually a new site that we're measuring on. So when you see the surges in green at the bottom, you can actually see the blue line went up. So these were people visiting the new site when there was some kind of news, right? So those surges were caused by humans. Whereas on the top, you'll see where the green bars are surging. That's the very last day of the month. You'll see that the red line went up. So that surge was caused by bots. And this is actually what we call end of month traffic fulfillment. So if it's a publisher that is running behind on their traffic and they won't make their number, right? They have a revenue goal or a traffic goal or something and they're running behind. Um, they really can't wait for a whole bunch of humans to visit that site on the very last day of the month. So what they do is they go out and buy bot traffic. And so this is what you see. You see a surge in traffic on the very last day of the month. And common sense will tell you that there's not a whole bunch of humans sitting around with nothing to do but to go to your specific website on the very last day of the month. So when you see this kind of phenomenon uh, with respect to a referring site or your own site, this is how you tell there's some uh, suspicious bot activity going on. Okay, for this next one, I took out the color to make it a little bit more challenging. Uh, so uh, which chart shows fake or sourced traffic, A or B? I'll give you a second to lock in your answer. Okay, hopefully you chose B. And now with color coding, it should be pretty obvious. But even without the color coding, um, if you remember the tip from before, you see those straight lines where it goes up and then goes across horizontally and then it drops down, right? That's basically when the botnet is turned on, right? They're pointing the traffic fire hose to the site and then after a little while, they turn it off for the overnight hours, and then they point it again to the site. So that's why you see those rectangular uh, patterns. So every anytime you see uh, straight lines, like vertical straight line, horizontal, and then vertical drop, uh, basically it's botnets. Uh, you're turning on the bot traffic or turning it off. Okay. Whereas in A, you can see there's a natural fluctuation in the pattern. And this, the lower volume hours are typically the overnight hours when humans are sleeping, right? So it's not exactly down to zero, but uh, you should see that kind of more natural fluctuation. The bottom one is where the botnet operators are trying to tune the traffic volume to mirror uh, the waking and sleeping hours. So years ago, they didn't do that. And it was just pretty simple to pick out. It was just horizontal. Uh, but now they're actually starting to tune, uh, tune the traffic volumes as well. Okay, so for this next one, which chart shows source traffic, A or B? I actually just gave you the clue, so this should be pretty easy. Lock in your answer, A or B. Hopefully you chose A. And in this case, you notice the volume bars in green are all exactly the same quantity of uh, traffic hour after hour, day after day. So again, it doesn't have the normal fluctuation in the pattern where the overnight hours have lower volume. So in this case, you can clearly see uh, this is suspicious traffic. Even though uh, in my system, they were able to trick the detection to make it look like blue, right? Light blue. So you know, people, if they look too casually, they'll just assume, oh, it's blue, so it's fine. Um, but in this case, if you look at the volume patterns, you'll still say, okay, even though it's blue, the volume doesn't make any sense. We need to check into it. Okay, and then I'll just run uh, these next three slides and then I'll open up to questions. So in this case, uh, we're gonna do a mix and match. There's A, B, C, and then on the right-hand side, you'll see three types of sites. And what I want you to do is kind of match each type of site to A, B, or C. Okay, so in A, what you're looking at would be kind of a daily volume chart where you see the volume increasing into midnight every day. In B, what you're seeing is a five plus two pattern where the five weekdays have lower volume than the two weekend days, Saturday and Sunday. And then in C, what you're seeing is a five plus two pattern again, where the five weekdays are higher in volume and there's practically no volume on the two weekend days. So go ahead and lock in your answer. 
uh, you're mixing and matching uh, to see which one goes with which. Okay, so hopefully you have your answers down. A would be the video entertainment site because people come home and stream uh, TV uh, into midnight and then after midnight, they start uh, going to sleep. B is the sports information site. So this is during football season. So Saturday is college football, Sunday is NFL. So uh, there's a much bigger spike in volume on the two weekend days. And then C would be the investment info site where when the markets are open during the uh, five weekdays, uh, there's a lot of traffic. When the markets are closed on the weekends, there's low traffic. Okay, so you can actually start to see these natural patterns uh, in the data. And I'll do one final slide. Okay, actually you probably know what this is. Um, so which chart looks legit, A or B? And this has to do with uh, video entertainment. So lock in your answer, A or B. Hopefully you chose B. And basically you ask yourself, when do humans uh, watch Roku? So it's basically when they, this is pre-pandemic. Okay, so when they get home from work, uh, they start streaming and then they watch uh, into midnight and then some of them drop off and go to sleep. Whereas in chart A, if you just look at the green volume bars, you'll notice that most of the volume happens. It starts uh, right after midnight and then uh, 4 a.m. right between midnight and 4 a.m. is where you have the highest volume uh, of, of the day. And then it drops down after that. So if this were a video streaming type site or content, um, that doesn't make any sense, right? If you think about your own habits, uh, you're going to be streaming in the evenings more uh, versus between midnight and 4 a.m. And then, and then everything goes away. All right, so Adam, I'll leave it here. Uh, there's a ton more slides. I'll share it in the Slack or Adam will share it in the Slack. So anyone uh, who wants to take a look at this further can, can look at this, but uh, let me get to some of the questions or maybe Adam, you can help me pick out uh, some of the questions I should answer. Yeah, some of these um, you may have touched on. So uh, if okay. you've already covered it, just let me know. Um, so first one I've got here is regarding ad fraud, um, and the general ineffectiveness of programmatic advertising. Um, what do you think of the recent book by Tim Huang? Do you have an opinion on it? Yeah, it's, it's perfectly parallel to what we saw in the financial crisis in 2008. So basically, you know, at the time, the ratings agencies like Moody's were bundling junk bonds or junk mortgages into you know, higher rated mortgages and selling the bundle. So it made it look like they were higher rated. So I think in, in what we're seeing today in programmatic is that some of these fake sites or fraudulent sites are kind of bundled together because now when a big marketer buys across programmatic, their ads get shown on hundreds of thousands of sites. So in that mix, there's going to be some fake ones, maybe some smaller legitimate ones, and then maybe some big ones. So when everything's mixed together like that, it's much harder to pick out what's real or not. So I think as a general tip, uh, for the small business owners who are more hands-on in terms of their analytics, I typically say, if you're going to do Google search advertising, make sure you turn off search partners and GDN so that your search ads run on Google itself because humans do Google things, right? So there's still going to be humans there. Uh, and then the other thing would be the, these fraud bots are not going to be rampant on the main property of Google because they can't make money. Right? If the ad loads on google.com and someone clicks on it, Google makes the money. So these fraud bots are not going to waste their time on something they can't make money on. So typically they will go to the sites that pay them for the traffic or pay them for the clicks. And very similarly on Facebook, if you're going to do Facebook display advertising, uh, just like the small business owner that I showed earlier in, in this deck, uh, make sure you turn off Facebook audience network. And those are all the sites outside of Facebook uh, that can inflate their own traffic and therefore ad revenues by using bot activity and bot traffic. So if you just limit your ads to only Facebook itself, Facebook proper, um, you're going to cut out most of the fraud, right? And then you can really start to fine tune that afterwards. And I think this covers the next question is um, someone that followed up with saying, do frauds affect programmatic only or also traditional Google ad campaigns? So it sounds like you're saying if you do it on Google, 
you're you're in pretty good shape. Yeah, you're kind of avoiding most of it, right? Because you can imagine on a search partner site, so a site outside of Google, um, they get a part of the rev share, right? They get a, a share of the revenue when they get a click, right? So that site gets a share, Google gets a share. So in those cases, that site has both the motive and the means, i.e. bot activity, to uh, inflate their own revenue. So they can buy bot traffic and say bots will need to click on those search ads in order for them to earn the CPC. So because they can do that, um, you know, that's the motive and the means. They, they can use the botnets to do that. But if you're limiting it onto Google itself, uh, Google.com itself, you're going to be not exposed to this rampant fraud uh, done by bots. Yeah, we just had another one come in. Um, is it safe to assume that Google shopping ads are not as susceptible versus affiliates? Um, that's a good question. I hadn't thought about that too much, but just know that um, there's a lot of cookie stuffing and affiliate fraud going on where when you when a human visits a particular web page, uh, if the site is unscrupulous, they're going to load a bunch of affiliate pages under underneath it, right? Kind of in a pop under or hidden in a one by one pixel window. So, for example, if they load Macy's.com complete with affiliate um, codes in the URL, they would have they would have done cookie stuffing so that uh, that whenever that user buys something from Macy's.com, whoever did the cookie stuffing will actually earn the affiliate rev share fraudulently. So still be on the lookout for that. I think shopping ads, um, again, if they're shown on Google itself, the fraud bots won't have a financial motive to click on those. So I think those will be a little bit better than affiliate type fraud elsewhere. Okay. Uh, one question was related when you were talking about uh, malvertising traffic. Uh, do we need to check on all outgoing traffic from specific pages or screens to identify the site or app frauds? Um, malvertising is a little bit of a different issue. So malvertising is highly, highly specific. So very often, even the publisher themselves won't see it happening. And that's because the malvertising perpetrators will actually target either down to the device or a specific um, type of device. So they'll see it's an iOS device. So then they're gonna attempt uh, malware exploits designed for iOS versus if they see it's an Android device, they're gonna attempt different malware exploits for Android. And then these malware writers are actually um, advanced enough to not trigger their malicious code unless they see some kind of human interaction, right? So if they see motion and orientation uh, on the device, then they'll trigger. So it's actually very hard for even a researcher or a malware researcher to even reproduce those. So in those cases, it's almost think of those as surgical attacks. But yes, they're going to divert a portion of your visitors off to some other site. Um, I'm not sure you can see all the you know outbound and where they land. But if you can see that, it would be good to check to see if there's a large quantity of it because you really don't want a large quantity of those clicks leaving your site and going to malicious domains. Okay, um, so we got a couple more questions. I think we probably just have time for one more. Um, Thomas asks, I understand those fraudsters who are generating impressions and fake clicks on fake websites to get money, but what about those bots, uh, non-official crawlers who are clicking your ads on some pretty known websites like New York Times or even Facebook? Um, how are they profiting from your campaigns? Um, that's actually kind of strange, right? If your search ad or your display ad is running on New York Times, um, then that would be more like a malicious thing where they're trying to drain your budgets. Um, to me, I don't see that as a widespread use of botnets. Um, I do see that these bots will simply go to the sites that pay them for traffic. So I think it might be, unless you're seeing like a very, very high click through rate, um, you know, if it's somewhere 5% or less, uh, I think it's going to be, it's, it's rare to see that kind of bot attack that is meant to drain your uh, budgets. But again, um, I'm happy to go into more depth with, uh, with you afterwards. Okay. Uh, one last quick one. Um, once we do find fraud bots using analytics, should we advise our IT department to try to block that type of traffic? Or is that 
Is that even helpful? What's the next? Yeah. So I think if you're a site owner and you're a publisher, some of the bot traffic coming to your site, unless you're running ads on your own site, right? So if you're an e-commerce site or uh, you're a publisher, unless you're buying the bot traffic, there shouldn't be an overwhelming amount of bots, right? So when I look at mainstream publisher sites like Hearst or Condé Nast or Meredith, they don't have a large amount of bots on their site. And for the simple reason that if the ad loads on Hearst website, Hearst makes the money, right? So these fraud bots are also not going to waste their time causing a whole bunch of ads to load there. So that might be a more unique case or rare case. And again, we can go into a little bit more detail afterwards. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, we are out of time, but thank you so much, uh, everyone, thank for you. joining. And thank you so much for sharing this amazing content. This is something that a lot of us don't, don't even think about every day that's happening right underneath our noses. So um, I will, uh, I'll work with you to get the slides and okay. I'll provide any other questions. If there's a couple more you want to answer in the Slack group, that'd be great. Perfect. I'll see you but, on the Slack group. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Right. And thanks again for presenting. Thanks everyone. Okay, Have take care. Thanks.